because I can say back home it was the same thing my mum went out with a Jamaican boy that was a so- sailor in Guyana but because he was Jamaican and she was not supposed to be mixing with the Jamaican my mum got beaten by an electric cable in the middle of the road they were ignorant then So today, Winging It is going back to its roots. Not these roots, because you know I like 24 inches of the good stuff. So I am here with McConnan Sankofa, who is an author of The Rise of the Rastafari and Life in Gambia. And we are going to get down and African today. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be on the Winging It podcast. I am excited to hear about my culture. I'm gonna not because it's Black History Month because we know that it's a bit tokenistic, right? Yeah. Because we get one month out of the year. How do you feel about that? To me, I think Black History Month is is dead in a way because um, you can, I think you hit the nail on the head. Having I don't celebrate Black History Month for one month. I celebrate Black History all year round. Yeah. So I think you can't encompass Black History in just one month. Yeah. And I think it's there's two I have two sides one on the view like the first I think is what I just said what I mentioned to you the second view that I have on it though is at least uh, because we know black history isn't taught in a lot of places like say for example a lot of the schools or mm-hmm. what they teach of it so it does have some benefits because it does for example give um, there's a lot of events that do happen around black history Month. talking about events I wanted yeah. to talk about Hackney how do you feel about the breadfruit and the sour sap in the middle of Hackney as a representation of our culture? What's this? So, you, have you seen the monument? So, in Hackney at the moment, they have produced this monument of a breadfruit, a sour sap, and another fruit, and that is supposed to represent the Windrush. And it's just these big fruit in the middle of Hackney. For me, them things are taking liberties. That can't be our representation of our parental journey. Like my parents are from Guyana. Mm-hmm. My mum actually came on not the Windrush, but a boat when she was 21. And she travelled for weeks on end to get here to the UK to continue what my grandma started. My grandma came first and she was sent for and they did their life. We are way more than the fruits that used to grow in our fields. I felt offended and so I can understand when when we're discussing black history that there's a lot of people out here that feel a little bit hard done by by being black British actually do you call yourself black British Uh, no I don't call myself black British I regard myself as uh, African or person of African heritage but is that is that a box on forms there is on some for depending on whose form it is right so the most forms that you come across is that do you see that I do see the box black British, um, but I normally tick um, black African, black Caribbean if I see it because I've got Caribbean or African with me. But I would normally tick if I was on t- on a form, I would probably tick African and Caribbean if I'm honest. Wow. wow. So where are you from originally? So my mum is of Jamaican heritage. Yeah. Uh, she was born in England. Uh, my dad is from Malawi, which is in Southeast Africa. Right. And so. What makes you an expert of African culture? You know what? I never put myself and said that I was an expert of African culture. <laughs> I just said it. <laughs> so, I just tried a thing, so, and I'm not. Oh, I'm, I put you on the I, 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 I'm not saying I'm an expert of African culture. I want that to be very clear as well. <laughs> right. Clear as well. Right. Um, and there's one thing that I actually want to touch before we 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 get right, into this right. as well. I would say I'm well. I am a Pan Africanist, but I don't say I'm an expert on African culture. Wait, wait, wait. What's a Pan Africanist? So a Pan-Africanist is a person of African heritage that uh, believes that people uh, of African heritage should put their differences aside from the common goal of all people of African heritage, whether on the diaspora, 
like England, USA, etc., or on the continent for the empowerment of of I don't say black African people. So, are we saying in short the rift between Africans and Caribbeans should not exist? Exactly. And All right, I need a, to come back to this because I don't know. You know, I'm going. And to, I just want to say, for example, when you say rift, there again, that word there is, is a bit a of a rift. It, dep- it depends. Oh. I would say there are some differences, but it depends on that. A rift, I think, it can be a bit strong. I mean, that means, implies that, you know, kind of like they're culturally, going out against each other. Culturally, yeah. I know we're going all over the gaff now, but <laughs> yeah. I, I'm hot on this one. And I still want to come back to you about the Windows generation because I've got some views on the Windows generation that are might be that are, might be controversial. Okay, we're going to come back to Windrush. I'm going to remember. But growing up in school, I know there was a rift. I know that there were African members of my class that were called ABCs. Remember that? I don't know if we're the same age. Do you know what ABC is? We used to, not we, them, (laughs) used to call them African. That was it. We were West Indian. They were African. That was it. And that has gone with the test of time. Now there are some intermingling and relationships, etc. But I do believe the rift exists. I think there's a big change i mean i remember when i was in primary school for example if anyone wants to know i'm 30 years old now oh I'm gonna yes. be 31 soon yeah. so you're 10 <laughs> years behind me yeah. so that might so be the difference when i was in primary school yeah there was for example um i don't similar things that you're mentioning yeah but it wasn't obviously it was abc but there were, there were things that were said that i don't really want to mention it here yeah. about um not negative terms that were used um often between say caribbeans and africans and and so i get what you're saying because i heard similar things when mm. i was at primary at, pr- at primary school that were said to a lot of the the african children now i the way i say african children because even though i've got both african and caribbean i was saying i was raised in my mom's family which was caribbean so i'm looking i'm taking a more of a caribbean kind of position right. where i'm speaking now yeah um so i get what you're saying however um I think over time, particularly now, for example, there's more, whereas in the past, there was more clashes that I would say between culture, between African and Caribbean. I think there is an element of it that it's still there, but I would say that the gap is being bridged a lot closer. And I would say there's a lot more like relationships now between Africans and Caribbean friendships, um, whether that's, uh, you know, people at school, whether that is like intimate relationships. So I would say now it's not as, um, much much as it used to be and also the way that caribbean people look at african people is very much different in a lot of ways than how it used to be particularly if you're looking at say jamaica um and the way that a lot of people and other islands as well for example um not to say that there still isn't some of that element but a lot of um people from the caribbean now for example like when we was talking about in primary school for example it was very negative mm. or, i remember when i was in primary school for african people a lot of caribbean people was thought very negative this that, and the other whereas now it's nice you go around and you see a lot of caribbeans their best a lot of their best friends or close friends are africans and and we're more integrated with african and we know more about african culture now as well so so yeah. because of us, um, because there's a lot more Africans that are in England now, I think like say in the 70s and 80s, going back a little bit further, I think it was clashing because of the experiences were different. Right. And this is because we had obviously the Windrush generation that came between the 1940s to the 1970s. And then you had, you know, the Africans, the Africans have been here like more recently, maybe it's the 70s, 80s, mm. 90s. And their experience is different than the Caribbean experience. Definitely. So, and I find, uh, but I find that that's quite difficult for me to be then put in the same bracket. And I say that because I have my mum was born in 1942, mm-hmm. and as I said, when she came, it was like 1957, I believe. Um, and her experiences of knocking door to door to find somewhere to live and having the signs, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, that created a, a hugely different vibe and an attitude to Britain and the culture and as you said coming in the 70s was a very different experience so I think we're almost discrediting the journey of our people if we were to put them in the same basket and that's what I'm hearing about pan-Africanism it's about you know we are all one just because of the motherland or am I getting it totally wrong well I would like to begin by saying that when you look at the Africans on the continent that come in, say, the 1890s or 2000s, for example, I think one of the the, the, the parts of the elements that clashes you kind of touched on to it is that 
they don't understand the Caribbean experience and whether that is through the experience in the Caribbean or the experience in this country and that could even go towards America as well yeah. so when you have the immigration the African immigrants that go into America they don't understand the struggle of like say civil rights Jim Crow so like when you're talking about you know the no blacks no dogs no Irish and this kind of struggle that we went through here mm. it's all because they don't know about it for example they I think they look at racism um, in a different way and they mm. also look at it things in a different way because where the Caribbean people are looking at being oppressed over the last 400 years through slavery colonialism and then coming to England etc the African on the continent is just coming here a lot of times from in, in Africa and they're just basically seeing England as, as an opportunity they're not also seeing they're not coming with that same kind of history like yeah. and then, I've been to Africa before I've been to Gambia and a lot of them are not even taught about slavery they know very little about slavery so or, so but when, there was for me there was a little bit of derogatory attitude also and I can only talk about what I've experienced and that's from my African counterpart wherever it be by jest or serious that would refer to us as slaves and well you lot are the slaves and for me and the slave name all of that for me is a lot so <laughs> to, to bridge the rift I think education it has to be key in it I was about to say in the head education I mean when I went to Gambia I actually did lectures in education um, mm. on Rastafari which encompassed black history um, and it, it was for a lot of the time the first time a lot of them actually found out information about you know the black experience in the diaspora about what we go through because a lot of like that kind of like what alluding to what i was about to say is that a lot of africans literally that particularly that are living on the continent yeah since a lot of us in the caribbean literally left the shores of africa they don't know anything about what happened to us in the caribbean i i remember being in gambia once and, and um he, my friend someone that i was speaking to he didn't actually he didn't even know that slaves were taken to jamaica yeah and mm -hmm. he i remember speaking to another person and he, he asked me is jamaica in africa yeah so these are the kind of things that I, that, I had that the wildest experience in gambia so i went there <laughs> to volunteer with my friend and it was I loved it. It was beautiful. One of the things that disappointed me about Gambia was the sex tourism industry. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk it plain <laughs> because that is what I saw. And I was really disappointed in, in, in Africa for that because we had been through enough of being slaves and being held down than to take a blind eye to children that were obviously with older white men and it for it to be allowed. I remember running up to a police officer saying, um, cause I've got his um, background in social work. And I said, there's a young girl in there and she's with this older white man and she's being abused because he was more or less groping her in the restaurant. And the guy was like, look, this is our main form of industry. And I'm not going in there and I'm not stopping anything. And that really disappointed me about Af like, and that was my first, I've been to Nigeria since, but I thought, wow, we've been through so much. Then, I went to James Island and then I went to Kunta Kente's village, which I felt was a farce. And I thought mm -hmm. my own people are actually taking liberties with me. I remember getting there and there was this old auntie there and she's telling me to come. I thought, nah, what do you want from me, sis? <laughs> like, nah. And she's telling me about leave her something. And I thought, what to all these other white people? Why are you calling me? Why are you calling me? Don't call me, sis. And she's like, you look like my sister, Kunta Kente's great aunt from... I said, really, honey? And I thought, how are my people taking advantage of me like this? You lot are my people. I got to the airport. You know, they wouldn't let me on the plane. The woman said that my passport was fake because look at me. She said, look at your dark skin. You look like us. You are not from England. You are not British. You are from here. They had to call the embassy to verify who I was. After that, I would never go to Gambia again. <laughs> I'm not saying anything about all the people that love Gambia. But that was a shocking experience for me. And I felt really disappointed about that being Africa. What I would say is that, um, before I talk about my, my bit, my, my experience of Gambia, I can do is that it's only one small country in Africa. True. It's a tiny, tiny country, the Gambia, True. which doesn't reflect the 55 countries because all of those countries have got their different cultures, got yeah. different tribes, they've got, uh, very different, they're very, very different in, um, obviously the way a lot of the, the, the leadership in a lot of the different countries. So, um, I would say that, 
don't not not that you're doing this but i would say for example like people that may be listening for example <laughs> even when we are speaking about gammy and i speak quite positively about gammy on my book <laughs> but it doesn't do. <laughs> it doesn't reflect you the need whole my chapter right <laughs> of, of africa uh, yeah. because obviously nigeria is different you speak to someone in southeast africa it's different and one thing that's interesting as well is that uh, a lot of people that are in safe example um, Gambia they might not even necessarily know about a lot of the countries that are in other parts of Africa like South East Africa Definitely. or in um, yeah in East Africa for example they may know about some of the neighbouring countries but in terms of certainly knowing what's going on and mm. uh, global affairs uh, the information it may be very very limited but side note it's a beautiful place like I actually really did apart from that nearly not redeemed to return back to England I loved it I loved the experience I worked in a school for a little bit and I tell you, it really um, changed much of who I was at the time and um, helped me to grow. I was in like my mid 20s and it was definitely something that I needed to do. But what I wanted to ask you about, you, you made a comment about Rastafarianism. And I wondered how. So, for example, me as a black woman. Before today, I never linked myself to Rastafarianism in any way. And maybe that's ignorance, or maybe it's because I'm not Jamaican. Do you know what I mean? Like, I really, I mean, I'm really interested because I never. You, cause well, you're, you're still Caribbean. You're from Guyana, right? Yeah. So the link, the connection between Rastafari and you, yeah, could and um, or potentially the potential connection is the this Rastafari is emerged in the 1930s in in jamaica mm. yeah following the, uh, the coronation of emperor emperor Haile selassie in ethiopia now even though um the early founders began uh preaching about in the island of jamaica in the 1930s it is spread worldwide and it spread throughout the continent uh, throughout the uh, islands in the caribbean so is yeah. rastafarianism a culture is it a religion is it a lifestyle what is it that's very interesting, you know, and it would it would depend on it will, on who you ask what will answer that in a different way, which is quite unique within itself. You know, I'm actually going to define Rastafari as I define it in my book, The Rise yes, of Rastafari: please. Resistance, Redemption, and Repatriation. Um, so, in my book, I actually say Rastafari is a Pan African movement that is aimed at the uplift of Black people spiritually, culturally, politically, and economically. Rastafari is about liberating the minds of Black people because we have been taught to think bad about ourselves due to subjugation and brainwashing that has been imposed on us over the last 500 years which has come from slavery colonialism neo-colonialism and cultural imperialism rastafarians regard ethiopian emperor Haile selassie as either an idol god or the reincarnation of jesus christ so that so is as a christian how can I be aligned with someone that idolizes an emperor? So Christianity and Rastafari are completely two different. This is things, what I'm yeah? saying. So then, but I you can <laughs> connect from it as a black woman because let me answer your first question now. Rastafari is about the experience of the descendants of enslaved Africans. Yeah, so obviously everyone that's listening to yourself is familiar with slavery, so we don't need mm. to go too much detail about it, but descendants of the enslaved Africans obviously dur during slavery let me say that what happened was not just a physical enslavement but a mental enslavement yeah so like the, the culture the language uh, everything was basically brainwashed given new names etc and told to forget about Africa and told to you know think black is bad white is good white is superior and that still carried through in the caribbean particularly concentrating in jamaica um in the colonial years because e even after slavery it still it was still colonial jamaica was a colony until 1962 a lot of the caribbean countries were still colonies in until up to the 60s and what was really still society which was very anti-african anti-black so what rastafari is significant in making that connection between Jamaica uh, or the Caribbean people in the diaspora in general and Africa and saying that we need to actually start looking into our African heritage which was being taken away and start to reclaim it and really it's, it's a lot of it stems from Garvey's Marcus Garvey um, was a pan-African activist and Marcus Garvey had the UNIA which is, which is the biggest 
Black First Race Organization, Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League and it had millions of followers throughout the world and he had the Black Star Line with the intention to take black people back to Africa and um, his motto was up you mighty race you can accomplish for what you will and Marcus Garvey was trying to raise the self-esteem of black people which was very low at the time and saying that we need to start doing it for self so when Emperor Haile Selassie was crowned in Ethiopia in 1930 the significant was that is that Ethiopia to this day is the only African country that's never been colonised it's the fact that black people who'd been told they had no history could now start to look and see a black king so you didn't have to look at you know King George right. who people were looking at the time and then they could look back before that and see you know what H e Egypt the great Zimbabwe and realise that you know what African people had a history long before slavery mm. and so a glorious empowering. history so it's really Rastafari is about really reclaiming that history that was stolen and saying as a as a black person as black people going into nation building and pan-africanism that we should be doing it for self we shouldn't be relying on other people to do for do for us but with all with all areas there are the stigmas so we've got the the weed the whatever but you don't have to be a locks wearer to be a rastafarian no that's not true in fact uh let me clarify that so the people that actually started the Rastafari movement, people like Leonard Howard, Joseph Hibbert, Robert Hines, Archibald Dunkley, and, and the other fuck the founders, they didn't have locks. Locks didn't really come mm. into Rasta until about mid fifties. And, and it mm. came in again, connected with Africa, but the Mau Mau warriors in, in uh, Kenya were fighting to get independence and they grew their hair in locks. And then a lot of Rastafarians started copying the hair, the locks because they saw imagery in the Mau Mau warriors in Kenya. So they, it, that in, in Africa, um, locks is a hairstyle that has been, one for millennia it's been word before you know the dada etc but again connecting with africa you've got the, the 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 lots coming from there you've got a group called the naya bingi which is another rasta mm. mansion yeah and naya bingi is a movement in uganda rwanda and it's um an, an empress there queen naya bingi who was resisting against colonialism mm. the baba shanti is another rastafari group the shanti is a tribe in Ghana that comes yes. from the Akan and most a lot of the not most say but a lot of the Ashanti were taken as slaves into Jamaica yeah so that's the connection there and they're saying right. that they, they, they're, they're lost from the Ashanti tribe yeah so there's various different other connections with because we didn't know what part of africa we just knew we were from we, um west africa generally but what russ has done as pan-africa has, has claimed the whole of, of of africa and so what about the differences i know we've so we've got pan-africanism that is joining the two but what about the struggle within africa itself so the the, the misalignment potentially between Ghanaians and nigerians because that exists I think that's natural. I mean, that's always existed, even before colonialism. I mean, even in, if you look at Europe, there's tension between you. Other people in Europe don't like each other. Yeah, mm. the the English man don't like the. We just had Brexit, which shows <laughs> which shows yeah. the British people what the British people think of European people. Like, like for example, so like if you look at Europe, I mean, England and Germany had World War, didn't they? And uh, we, we started. So if you look at Europe nations, it's the same thing. They, the European nations don't like each other. But the thing with European nations, they come together. When it comes to yeah. your and I position as black people, when it comes to white supremacy, they can come together for the empowerment of our people. This is what we should be doing as Pan-Africanists. But we are too divided. Instead of saying that now, we need to come together for the empowerment of African people. We are willing, we're, we're too separated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get. And, and, and I know it's about the separation because even within our culture I wonder if there is a sense of superiority with those like yourself who have changed their name so is it that you have reclaimed your roots so much so that you have taken your birth name to a more Africanized name and is there some level of power and superiority in that I would say there's power in it I wouldn't say there's a, a superiority because someone could change the African name and someone could have an English name it's still like about the works of actually what someone does yeah right. and when uh, you say the work what do you mean it means that what people are actually doing what like say for example if someone is on this path of you know um african consciousness or black consciousness for example um is, is that person active what is he doing for the empowerment of people of african heritage right. yeah and that could be in many different in different different ways but um how someone lives his life for example so it, it there's 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 various things about going into another <laughs> tangent, but, but for you it, what, what what inspired you to do that see i didn't want to have uh, an english name uh, a european name because 
I come into to African consciousness. So I chose McConnan because Haile Selassie, he was called Rastafari McConnan. Yeah, and his father was Ras McConnan. So because of my, um, or uh, of what my way that I idolize Haile Selassie, that's why I chose that as a name and me being a Rastafarian. And then Sankofa, that is uh, Ghanaian, that is from the Akan tribe, and that means to. To go back and fetch it means to go Sankofa to go back and look in your roots and learn from the past to um, move forward and prosper in the future yeah which is I think what embodies me as, uh, and and who I am so I felt the need to change my name to have a reflection of my identity and who I am I think during the process during like obviously slavery when our names were changed and even to this day we still have like a lot of people have these British names for example where when you look at a uh, a, a person like when you look at a black person they've got like a name like james or smith etc it is it, it's it's identity again it's like for example that name is you might have a black face but that I, when you look at a name you know that's not african name so it's really having that full kind of connection with africa and that full kind of in identity which embodies you as a person i think name is a very very it, important it is and i think mm-hmm. you know i'm called camilla yeah that's not my name. Mm-hmm. People say it in the anglified way. My name is Camila. It means the perfect one. It has meaning. It has foundation. It was taken from Africa. But I have become lazy with my own name. I don't correct because I can't be asked. Because 39 years later, I decided I can't be bothered. But now you said it. I think to myself, actually... Having a name of power and meaning, I should make the emphasis on being recognised for the name that I was given or name for me that was chosen for a particular reason. Yes, my surname is Scottish and there's not one part of me that looks Scottish, apart from the ginger tips that I have today. But I feel that I am not Africanized enough to change that because I feel also that it is taken away my legacy my father his father their journey their representation of their journey to get here so even though it may have started as a slave name it has for me emancipated it's developed it is now recognizing and representing this beautiful black woman that's what the me, surname means a slave name is always a slave name to me not to I, me like, i'm hey, involved yeah, yeah. i don't know about you but i'm to involved me, i have taken name. my name i have reclaimed it <laughs> i have name. re-owned it and i will continue that that's for me i know i, I hear i hear you i hear you fully but i think we all have our own reasonings so let's go back to the windrush because i know you had a little point well, yeah this is actually interesting because you're talking about the the, the plight and the journey and is it? I think it's fitting that we are now talking about the Windows generation because I want to link it into Rastafari, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is actually a big reason why I think the Windows generation often get a lot of um, praises, etc. And particularly now, um, they get a lot of credit. Um, where I'm, my my view on the Windows generation, I think yes, they came here to build the country and they they did some good things, but when I look at not all of them, but um, when I had a reasoning with a Rasta elder about this, and this is actually kind of sparks one of some of my views on 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 how I look at the Windrush generation, and he was like, he doesn't give much credence to them because they're the same people that terrorized the um not all of them, but the Rasta in Jamaica, and I had to agree with him. And I was when I when I looked at it, and I've spoken to a lot of Rastas about this about and and getting people's different opinions about it, etc. Um. Because it's an interesting topic, and I didn't, I never looked at it in this way until I reasoned with that elder about it. Um, but my views on it is 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 because I I always knew about the persecution. You may not know, but Rastafari, particularly in Jamaica and amongst other islands, have been heavily persecuted. Yeah, um, people like couldn't walk the streets; they would have their locks cut off. That's why a lot of them had to go in the hills. You had an incident in Jamaica where Buster Manti said after an incident bringing all Rastas dead or alive if the prison can't hold and throw them in a cemetery basically issued genocide against the Rasta community and it was the Prime Minister who's a so-called Jamaican national hero but Rastas were terrorising Jamaica in Dominica you had the dread law which said that if you see some of Lots they could be shot on sight even though Leonard Howe he didn't the, the pioneer of the Rasta movement didn't Lots he was put in a mental asylum and he was really suppressed um, 
And when I, a lot of the people that actually came from the islands, particularly Jamaicans, from that 1940s to 1970s, a lot of them not, were not exactly doing those specific incidents, like in the, but a lot of those were the same people that were pressing the rest of the community in Jamaica and even in when they came into this country they were the same people why Rasta couldn't walk on the streets they were the same people that used to call Rasta dirty Rasta and you put cow shit in your hair and all them kind of things so they, yes when they came to this country and and the, the NF and the teddy boys and all of that were treating them badly in a way they're hypocrites because this was kind of like the same not exactly the same but it was a similar treatment that they were doing to Rasta to their own people and why because they were black because they were being proud to be in black in the 60s and 70s that when the the younger generation like their children um um came um started to rise up and get towards Rastafari like 15 16 year olds etc the, the 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 people that came over from the Windrush generation, like say like my grandparents' generation, what did they do? They threw these people out on the streets. Mm. Yeah, the system was already racist towards them. Yeah, they and imagine you. It's basically like your your son come home and said, and because he, he's got locks on his hair, you throw your son on the street because he's not accepting Christianity. You throw your son on the street, and this goes beyond Rastafari. Right? This goes into just a lot of other affairs, like maybe because the child didn't accept Christianity. Um, I, I know somebody got thrown out on the street because she had a, um, a child at a very young age. This is what the Windrush generation were like. And this is the side we don't hear about the Windrush yeah, generation. Yeah, definitely. And I hear that because mm. my mum was one of those. My mum was someone that had my sister at, out of wedlock and was frowned upon and, you know, disowned because of it. It wasn't... The, there was... But as you said, there are good and bads of every culture, every time that we go through and it isn't great but i do think recognizing the journey that we took i mean there was that program on the other a few months ago which actually highlighted our lack of stability in this country that decisions were made for the windrush generation to be returned home but you know and, and the windrush generation they they were house negroes yeah they were the ones that come here and it was like submissive and it was like queen elizabeth and it was like british values and everything and they didn't want their children to, to learn patois in 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 um in the house and all of these kind of things do you know how many so, people would be offended so that you no, said they were house negroes they <laughs> were they were so and and as soon as the black people that like the ones that were conscious the rasters and the other people that were in black consciousness in general they were suppressing their own people yeah that's what they were doing they were they were fighting against their own people even though the system was racist against them throwing their own children but they were the trying to survive no i so because we can't because i can say back home it was the same thing my mum went out with a jamaican boy that was a soul, sailor in guyana but because he was jamaican and she was not supposed to be mixing with the jamaican my mum got beaten by an electric cable in the middle of the road they were ignorant then they weren't just ignorant when they come here with their foolishness what i'm saying is that that's we shouldn't excuse that generation and say that oh we, they shouldn't be given that kind of um excuse that 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 that, uh, that that we do and we still need to realize what that generation did and yeah, and, and the, the the terror the terror that they imposed on the rasta community and then but also could... if we're going to think about the terror and and the injustice when i'm okay as a pan-africanist how do you view a black woman like myself who wears 24 inches of european hair <laughs> that's an interesting question uh, <laughs> obviously i would prefer um it's your choice to be honest okay uh, my my what i would say if yeah, you ask me for my give opinion it to me good. yeah give it that, to me good i always believe people should have like hair in the natural so i think it's kind of weird people put in like other people's <laughs> hair in their head and, and it's straight particularly if it's like a, a, a woman a hair of someone who's not your own culture as well, well no, like she's, Brazilian. <laughs> she's Brazilian she's Brazilian white Brazilian or black Brazilian she different, is but. from South America <laughs> and so am I so but know. all that when you see white people <laughs> in Indian hair and all that kind of stuff I find that kind of like I think it, yeah I think it's strange one putting hair, other, someone else's hair in your head in general does, it, does that then, mean that I'm less black I don't think it does mean I don't think me personally again because I ain't got no afro yeah no 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 no. but I don't think it does just like for example like I said before like um, even like for example the, the locks for example I don't think just because someone's got dreadlocks and um, that they become or um, or whether like your name we mentioned name for example just because someone's got African name it makes them necessarily more again I think it's about the person themselves and the works right. because you can have someone and this is why I actually argue you can have 
someone who maybe has like a really short skull, she has like cleavage, etc., and a woman who cover ups and everything like that. But that woman who has got more like cleavage on, or in your case, for example, you're you've got um. You can say it weave. You can say (laughs) weave. You've got weave weave on. There could be another woman, for example, who has got um, natural hair in lots, or she's got hair like that, for example. But you know what? You're a more thorough person. But do you not think I'll be judged Mm. by the Pan African community if I were to turn up to one of the meetings with, you know, my acrylic nails and my long hair? I'm not going to be judged. Well, I I think it depends on the person. I can't say you, the, the Pan African community because <laughs> again, when you say the Pan African community, yeah, it like for example, who exactly is oh, that? Look, because, oh, look. <laughs> like, because that's because and what kind of community? Because it could be like there could be Pan Africans in London, in in, USA, in Africa, where like I think there's a lot, but I think it depends on the person. Because that's what but, I feel. I feel uncomfortable. But, I'm not going to lie. Personally, um, is 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 your it's your it's your opinion, but I don't think that that deters you just because you've got it a weave does. on. I'm what? telling you, no, it no, makes no, me feel no, uncomfortable. No, it might make you uncomfortable, but I don't think, for example, um, like for example, if you had a weave on, but you was like, um, depending on obviously the works you're doing, and if you said you're Pan Africanist, etc., I don't think you know what just because you've got a weave on, but you say that you're Pan Africanist, that that you should be thought of less or that I think it's still in actually what's inside you and actually what actually you go out and do because now this is what correlates to Rastafari in so much ways because there's so many Rastafarians that have got long locks down to their legs but they do fuck all for Rastafari right, right? and they're fornicate and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. all sorts of youth and, and look after they them just, and-, and they just use the name and, and they in, 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 and they tarnish Rastafari by doing it and they're posters so having a having basically your parents doesn't always necessarily mean um like for example it doesn't it doesn't give um true justice to the actual person inside because i have to say when i've gone to more culturally orientated things i do feel an outcast i feel like i haven't wrapped my hair i haven't worn wooden jewelry I haven't got nine million rings on. See, and that is, for me, there is a stigma. I, I get where you're coming from. I think as black people, we need to move away from these. These are superficial. These are little tick. These are superficial things. I because think, I asked you another thing. Looking at you, yeah, you're not the blackest black man. Yeah. So how are you spitting to me about Gambia? And the, 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 I'm talking about the man well, out there might be saying that. Do you, you know say, what I mean? You say I'm not the blackest black man. <laughs> no, do you understand? What I'm about? Even complexion. Oh, you look okay, like that. you've got you've got a bit of Indian in you. I do actually you a little, see? a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you know, there could be someone out there. Could, who is he I, telling me about blackness? A lot of and his and his mama is whatever. Do you know what? Do you understand <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> you know, you know what? My, my, my dad, my dad is mixed. He's half Indian, half half um, African. Yeah, so technically I'm three quarters black. Yeah, so I'm majority <laughs> black. But you know, a lot most black people, a lot of black people, particularly from the Caribbean, have got some mixture anyway. There's black people that are dark as you that have got more mixture than you than me. Yes. Yeah. Um. So you can't. So it's really silly to. You can have people that are like me. I've no mixed race people that are darker than yes. like your complexion, and you have mixed race people that look white. So someone's complexion I don't think necessarily you should just look on someone's complexion and say what they are I mean Heidi Slassie he looks just me like I, yeah. identical you could say that about Heidi Slassie he doesn't look like the blackest black person he looks a bit Indian he looks a bit Arabic he he as well so you he get does. me it, it, so I think again it, it it's down to the actual person it's like do you actually know my DNA like mm-hmm. for example as, as well and someone could be saying that but they doesn't know their DNA has got more white in them or they got more a mixture in that DNA than have you ever done a DNA white, test or? I have actually. And what's it come out? Of? <laughs> ah, you're German, aren't you? You're German. I am not German. <laughs> and this is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, it came out as um, it was sixty-five. I believe it was around sixty-five percent West African Ooh. and and, and um, African, basically. But the other the other up areas was um, because my dad is half half black, half Indian. He came out as I think about twenty some twenty. Your case is thrown out of court. You're only sixty five percent. We have to tell him about black. But a lot of people, <laughs> no, 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 but you know what I said. A lot of black people, like I said, have got like sixty percent, and they've yeah. got fir- they've got forty percent white. Yeah. Uh, in them and this is if they did it or they've got like maybe 70% black and then 30% what I'm trying to say is that uh, apart from a lot of those that were directly like born on the continent particularly us of Caribbean heritage have got some mixture down the line but I'm explaining why I have a little bit of that because of my dad yeah because my dad was mixed yeah but I'm still a majority black yeah I'm 65% and it's it's that's from obviously Africa and then I'm not like 35% white I'm like 20, 25% in, in Indian and then the, the 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 rest is like 
um, yeah, a bit of a bit of white. Yeah, yeah. But I'm still majority. <laughs> Don't deny your I'm heritage. Still, I'm still majority black, and obviously that would be down through like raping and that kind of stuff that happened mm. during slavery oh, and them kind gosh. of stuff. That's yeah, a whole other podcast. But what I'm trying to say is that the majority of my ethnicity is black. My my mum that I was raised with is a black woman, and my dad is mixed race, and he was born and raised in Africa. Yeah, and he's his and one of his parents is African. So I would I only look at myself as a black person on 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 that basis. Why would I look at myself as anything less when the majority of me is black and both and both of my parents have got black and my dad was actually an African born on the continent. Yes. Did you hear that? Black man this sinner. <laughs> well, we have talked for a good time. And if you haven't learnt something, you need to rewind, start again, and meet us back here at zero 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 because we have learned. I have learned. And this has been Camila, aka the perfect one, with my pan African homie now. I'll be going to some meetings with him and shaking hand with the goddesses and queens of our people. It's been a pleasure. You know what? You know what I wanted to say other girls as well, yeah? Because I don't think we should always call ourselves goddesses and queens because Oh gosh. We're goddess, because oh. We're, we're not all goddesses and queens. And this is the yes, thing, I, I, am. Re- I really don't like this when as particularly with well, a lot you of don't like king and particularly with a lot of w- women, yeah. They're always like, I'm a goddess, I'm a, I'm always a queen. It's like, no, you're not, yeah. Just be, you're not just a queen just because you're a black woman, yeah. You're not that and let, let's stop that, yeah. You what have you done to be deserving of being a co- called called a queen? Like again, it's all about you as a works, but I don't think a lot of women just call themselves, you know what. I'm queen or I'm goddess this or yeah, I don't even believe a man should just be like oh you know I'm just going to be bigging up myself and call myself call myself a king I think we need to come out of this whole you know what, what we're just looking at, looking at ourselves empress you like empress <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but even that you, you shouldn't just be able to just be label, labeling just believing that oh we're all so wait, we're, you never, we're all you never talk to a lady and say yo empress <laughs> empress <laughs> if their name is actually called empress <laughs> but <laughs> not on the one that but we need to stop just saying that, oh we're king to be but I think particularly black women black women have got this thing about uh, about them even when they don't rate men yeah they're not they're like but they're always like for example oh you know i'm a i'm a, a goddess or i'm a queen i'm a queen no you're not man prove that you're a queen wait a minute this has been queen camilla signing out <laughs> <laughs>